Okay. And we are at time. All right. Uh, Kim, uh, my name is uh, Aman Kochar. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I am so privileged to have this time with you uh, in this forum and for our attendees that uh, in our attendee list is growing as I see on the right, uh, which is very, very exciting. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, I'll maybe take a few, maybe take a few seconds for the attendee list to stabilize so that we can do the proper introduction and then get on our way. That would be amazing. Thank you. I'm going to encourage everybody to type into the chat where they are and how they're feeling today. And you can be radically candid about how you're feeling. You don't have to pretend that everything is great. Uh, tell us what's really going on for you. I love doing this. It kind of recreates that that sensation of the mood in the room. <coughs> That's amazing. So, I'm in Los Altos Hills, just south of San Francisco. It's foggy oh. here, and I'm feeling calm this oh, morning. Lovely. I am in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is getting hot, and I'm just getting used to going into the office a few days a week. And uh, I have air in my lungs and all of you as my companions, so I am very grateful. We still have some attendees growing and growing. All right, we got Cindy from central New Jersey and ready for retirement. I know Cindy. No, Cindy, <laughs> you're not ready for retirement. We need you a little longer. <laughs> Uh, or New Jersey. Beach weather in New Jersey. Go to the beach. That's my recommendation. Go to the beach. It's only Thursday. That's right. Lake Hills, Illinois. Sounds like a good bike riding day there. Lake in the hills. Cloudy day and I'm feeling or maybe a bike ride today. It's beautiful. Bike ride by the lake. Nothing like it. Get some breeze. Get some exercise. That's great. Awesome. All right. To all the attendees, just a reminder, please feel free to use uh, the chat function. Your questions can be can be used with the, with the Q&A function um, or with the chat function. Either way is OK. But tell us how you're feeling, how you're doing this morning. Uh, Kim and I would love to hear where you're from, what is going on with you uh, and include you in our uh, conversation this uh, um, this morning. Okay, same working remote, Lake in the Hills, all is good. I like to hear that. All right, uh, I think it's time we, we get started and we'll keep revisiting some of you and, uh, and the emotions. Uh, we are loving it. So uh, as most of you will know, uh, if you're joining in from my organization, Baker and Taylor or Follett, you know, I'm a big fan uh, of Kim's earlier work, Radical Candor. I quote it if not on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, use it, practice it, um, have my own version of it. Um, um, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, future <laughs> collaboration with Kim. But um, Kim is the author of her new uh, work, Just Work. And as I expressed a radical candor earlier, she's co-founded two companies that help organizations put the ideas in her books into practice. Kim was a CEO coach at uh, some of the leading technology companies like Dropbox, Qualtrics, <clears throat> Twitter, and other tech companies. Uh, Kim has previously held leadership roles at both Apple and Google, phenomenal companies, as you know, with tremendous brand equity and leadership roles. Uh, and very early in her career, Kim managed a pediatric clinic in Kosovo. Thank you for that, Kim. Uh, did not know that about you, and also started a diamond cutting factory in Moscow. <laughs> I've spent some time in St. Petersburg and in Moscow. I've actually been uh, as far as Vladivostok on the wow. on the eastern side of Mother Russia. Uh, but I'm uh, so Kim. Why don't we start? And I'm very interested to see how your experiences you know, in Kosovo with, with children and your diamond cutting experience and your leadership roles, how all of that, you know, we're all functions of our own experience, how all of that gave you the idea of putting your experiences together in the form of a book 
and you know making it a worldwide success how did it all come together for radical candor and then we're going to talk about uh, just work sure so my business career this is a strange reason to have a business career but it was all a, a plan to subsidize my novel writing habit <laughs> which, uh, so I wrote a bunch of novels, none of them ever got published. And, uh, and so I decided the way I was going to subsidize it was to go into business because that way I could make enough money to save money and then take a year off now and then. Uh, so that, that uh, is kind of the backstory. I, I think the reason that I love to read novels is that I'm interested in, in sort of how to live and why. How can we create environments in which we can love our lives and love our work and it, it's all integrated and works together and the time in russia really gave me a lot of examples of how to how to really screw all that up uh, in the <laughs> soviet union uh, and also it was my first management experience i was working with a bunch of diamond cutters in mm. uh in my, i had to hire them and I, I was 22 at the time. I thought hiring them would be easy. I would just pay them. That was all capitalism was, was paying people. And so I went to offer them this salary that was in dollars and rubles were worthless. And so the, I, thought it, I thought they would immediately, of course they were gonna take the job, but no, they didn't just want money. They wanted a picnic. Okay, well, I can do a picnic too. So we, we took a picnic to the outskirts of Moscow and when we finished drinking a bottle of vodka together, it became clear that what these people wanted was not just money, they wanted a boss who gave a damn. They wanted to know that if, if things went, if, if, if things disintegrated in Russia, which always seemed a real possibility, that there would be someone from the outside who would get them and their families out. And that was really the moment when management struck me for the first time as an interesting and worthy topic of thought. Fabulous. And I think Kim, that, that, that's what it's about. You know, people always look at uh, people who they work with, title. I think we lost you. Or did you lose me? I think we lost um, Aman. He should be back <laughs> up shortly. So sorry okay. about that. I didn't know if it was me or him. You never know. <laughs> no, no we, problem. We must, there he's we, back. You're back. I am. Okay. Can you all hear me okay? You sound great. Okay. So, uh, Kim, uh, you know, my, my next question is the duality of the word just in this book that I've been reading. And, you know, it says just work and at a first glance, it could just simply mean that, well, let's just work. Yeah. But there's a, there's a duality in there somewhere that also talks about, well, let's just work. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you know, talk to me a little bit about why, why are you focusing on this duality and what in your experience led you to believe that you needed to clarify this duality of the work, just work or let's just work. Yeah, so the I think the title, by the way, I've gotten some feedback and uh, I think the title might've been too, too uh, subtle because a lot of people who read it don't get the justice part that I intended uh, in, in the title. And so to me, the reason why I chose that is that there's a practical, practical side to creating an inclusive work environment. We will do better work if we will hire, we will hire the right people, we'll get more out of them if we can create this kind of work environment that's optimized for collaboration, which is after all humanity's superpower and, and not, not uh, organized for coercion, which is our, the opposite of a superpower. And if everybody is respecting everyone else, and, uh, and yet so often we don't do that. So that's the idea of just work. It's collaboration, which is productive. It's respect, which is also productive. And, and you get more justice and you get more fairness uh, and you get more productivity. So I wanted to get the idea that this works better and also is, is more just in the justice sense of the word. But I don't think that really came through. <laughs> I think you're on mute, Aman. 
I think that's that's right. Uh, but I think it's it's also to me whoever picks it up and reads it. You're right that it may not have come through, but there's definitely a few perspectives that you're uh, that you're giving over there. So you know, I want to continue on this chain of thought that you had about fairness and uh, uh, you know uh, prejudice. I think you you're providing some very uh, very uh, simple but articulate definitions for uh, you know bias uh, unconscious subconscious prejudice and and bullying and and you know a lot of people like me spend time on sometimes using these uh, in metaphors interchangeably different and so you know i i want to know from you how important is it to actually know the difference between maybe an unconscious bias or prejudice, which is more active, and uh, it you know the actionable form of that, which is bullying. So, how important is it to actually know the difference so you can mitigate those at an organizational level? I believe it's extremely important for me. The key insight in the book is is untangling. And in, in many ways, we treat workplace injustice as though it's a monolithic problem, but it's right. very difficult to solve a monolithic problem. So if you break a problem down into its component parts, it becomes much easier to figure out how, how to solve the problem. So right. for example, bias, I define as not meaning it. Bias is usually an unconscious uh, assumption that, that, that we have made. Whereas prejudice is meaning it. Prejudice is a very conscious belief. And uh, and and bullying is just being mean, right? There's no belief involved. And the way I have found to respond to each of these is very different. If somebody says something that is biased to me, uh, then it's best to respond with an I statement. I don't think you meant that the way it sounded or to take a specific example, I don't think you're gonna treat me seriously when you call me honey. I hate it when people call me honey. Uh, so, so that's bias, but it's usually not, there's not some deep seated prejudice behind these things. Whereas when sometimes, so for example, I was, and I, by the way, and this is probably kind of a white woman's privilege speaking, but I always assumed that it was all unconscious bias, that nobody could possibly believe that I was inferior, but, but sometimes they do. Sometimes there is actually a prejudice there. And if you, if you use an I statement in the, spa, in, uh, in the face of prejudice, if you invite someone in to understand things your way, if you hold up a mirror, it's not gonna do any good because the person will just sort of uh, say, yeah, I like what I see. So you've got to, in the, in the case of prejudice, you need an it statement. And an it statement sort of makes it clear where that line is between one person's freedom to believe whatever they want and my freedom not to have that belief imposed upon me. So, so for example, uh, my, my business partner, Tria Bryant, was in a hiring meeting and they had they had they had a hiring committee and everyone who had interviewed all the candidates agreed that the best candidate was a black woman who had worn her hair out naturally in the interview process but the hiring manager said oh we're not going to move to offer with her because we can't put someone with that hair in front of the business and mm -hmm. believe me nowhere in the in the in the hiring criteria was hair and so what's an it statement in the face of that you can an it statement can appeal to the law it can appeal to hr policy or it can appeal to common sense so it's illegal not to hire someone because of their hair which it is at least in california where i am it is an hr violation not to hire someone because of their hair which it was at that company or it is ridiculous not to hire the most qualified candidate because of their hair. Like that's an it statement. It's not going to say I. F it's not going to talk about how you feel or anything. Whereas bullying, when someone is trying to be mean, they're they're going to try to cross that line. Mm -hmm. And if you invite them in closer, they're just going to hurt you worse. In fact, my daughter explained this to me when she was in third grade, she was getting bullied on the playground and I was suggesting to her an I statement, tell this kid, I feel sad when you blah, 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 blah. And she banged her fist on the table and she said, mom, he is trying to hurt my feelings. Why would I tell him he succeeded? And I thought, gosh, 
that's a really good point. And, right. and so we decided a you statement, you can't talk to me like that. Or if that feels like it might escalate the situation, ask the person a you question, what's going on for you here? But mm -hmm. so to me, understanding at a, at a quick sort of instinctive level, the difference between bias, not meaning it, prejudice, meaning it, and bullying, meaning it, and responding to bias with an I statement, responding to prejudice with an it statement, rep responding to bullying with a you statement. And, you know, the, one of the tricky things about these situations is that we never know what to say. So there's a chapter in the book, what to say when you don't know what to say. And you're never gonna be totally sure whether it's bias, prejudice, or bullying, and you don't have to be. Just start somewhere. Say, if, you, if, you, if, you're, if instinct tells you it's probably bullying, start with the you statement. If instinct tells you it's probably bias, start with that I statement. But start somewhere, and then you'll get some more information out of the person. I, I think, Kim, that's, that's so lovely. And, you know, somebody who's gone through, you know, a lot of prejudice uh, in in my life, uh, personally and professionally. I I would say that you know people on the other side actually have a really nice radar. They know if your heart's in the right place, even if you if you use some terms that are inappropriate or maybe considered inappropriate. I'd say that it's start somewhere. Just take the first step, and most people are willing to explain their point of view, why their hair is different, why their color is different, you know, so yeah. on and so forth. Uh, but, but tell me, Kim, uh, you know, you, you and, uh, you, and uh, uh, you know, Trier have, have founded this organization at uh, Just Work. So tell the people who are listening to you the kind of work that, you, that you're looking to do in the work that's already been done in the organization. Great, sure, happy to. And I think somebody, one of the participants needs to mute. So at any rate, uh, the, one of the things that, that I realized as I was writing the book, and this is a hard thing for a writer to realize, but one of the things I realized is that th what we're talking about here is a pretty, pretty profound behavior change. And no matter how good a book is, people don't often, sometimes they do, but they don't often change their behavior because they read a book. I'm not saying don't read the book, read the book. It's the right first step. But a lot of leaders really needed help when, when rolling these ideas out. And in, in many ways, it was important for me to partner with Trier because I, I am in many ways, like I've had a lot of root canals, but I'm not a dentist in a way. So Trier has been a DE&I practitioner across the military. She was an officer in the Air Force and at Goldman Sachs and at Twitter. And she led people operations at, uh, at Astra, the rocket company. So she, and she started her own DE&I consulting practice. And so it is really important to partner with someone who, who knows the details about where the rubber meets the road. Like I made a lot of suggestions in the book and, uh, and luckily Trier is on board with, with them. But she also, there's a lot of nuance in how you roll these things out. So for example, we were just talking about bias and we were talking about bias interrupters and, uh, you know, sort of what I can say when I'm the person who's harmed by bias. But we can't, as leaders, put all the burden of fighting against bias on the people who are the targets of the bias. We need to create a system that will make it more likely that upstanders will say something. That uh, So for example, there's a story in the book about a friend of mine, Aileen Lee, and she walked into a meeting. She's the founder of Cowboy VC. And she walked into a meeting with two partners, uh, both of whom were men, and Aileen had the expertise that was going to win her team the deal. And when the other side came in, they're sitting at a long conference table. And when the other side came in, the first person sat across from the guy to Aileen's left. The next person sat across from the guy to his left. And then they trickled on down the table, leaving Aileen dangling by herself. So kind of a, a, an unconscious bias uh, manifesting in just the seating arrangements. And in fact, when psychologists do experiments, they often notice how people sit. So before anybody even opens their mouth, it's the, the dynamic is set up. 
And then Aileen starts speaking. And when the other side has questions, they ask her two colleagues who are men the questions. They, it's as though Aileen hasn't spoken, <laughs> ever seen this happen. And so it happened, it happened once, it happened twice, it happened a third time. And finally, Aileen's partner stood up and said, I think Aileen and I should switch seats. And that was all he had to do to totally change the dynamic in the room uh, and, and to be a good upstander and intervene in the situation. And he did that. Let's go back on to your, your point about the title, Just Work. He did that for two reasons. He did it partly for reasons of justice. He cared about Aileen and he didn't like seeing her get ignored, but he also did it for reasons of practicality. He wanted to win the deal and he knew if he couldn't get the other side to listen to Aileen that they wouldn't win the deal. So he just wanted to win the deal. And so so I think that is the kind of thing that we as leaders want to see more of. But, you know, I tell that story as though it happens all the time. It almost never happens that way. So what can you as leaders do? The thing that you can do is you can create what I call in the book bias interrupters. And there's two parts to a bias interrupter. The first part is just coming up with a shared vocabulary. What is the word or phrase that your team will actually use when someone in a meeting notices something that was said or done that's biased? And it should invite people in. It should not be a hostile sort of calling out kind of thing. But I don't think you meant that the way it sounded. Uh, Trier suggested that we wave a purple flag. So I went and bought these purple flags. <laughs> And when I say something biased and I, I notice myself, I'll wave it on myself. Or if Trier says something, I'll wave it on her. If I say something, she'll wave it on me. Uh, and this just becomes a norm. It's like not that big of, not that big of a deal. But there's a second part of the norm. It's not just about coming up with a shared vocabulary. It's also about teaching people when their bias has been interrupted, how to respond. So, there, and there's basically two responses. And they both begin with, thank you for pointing it out, because it takes courage. It is hard to point it out. And, and when someone points it out it, to us, it's an act of generosity, like telling us about the spinach in our teeth or the toilet paper on the heel of our shoe. We, we don't want to keep walking around doing the, with these kind of mistakes. Same thing with the biased things that we say or do. Most of us don't want to keep doing them. So it's an act. So give thanks for having it pointed out. But there's two, there's basically two things that happen. Either I get it and I'll work on not doing it again, or I don't get it. Can you explain to me after the meeting? And that I don't get it part is really the hard part. Because at least when I'm in that situation, I feel profound shame. Not only have I harmed someone else, I don't understand what I said wrong. So I've harmed someone else and I'm ignorant. And that, you, that combination usually, uh, at least in me, it generates a, a, a real profound sense of shame. Like I can tell you where I feel it physically. I feel the backs of my knees tingling as though I'm standing at the edge of a precipice. And when we, are, when we feel ashamed, we usually do not respond very well. And so an important part of bias interrupters is helping people move through that shame to a place where they can respond productively. So that's one very specific idea that I have for you all as leaders to create an environment that is more inclusive because we all have our biases and if we can help each other identify them, then we can change them. Right. So Kim, very specifically, you know, as you know, that our organization is a leader in uh, partnering with uh, public organizations like libraries, you know, in public space, in academic space, in schools, in education. And, you know, they cater to all uh, their, let me rephrase that, they're expected to cater to all members of the society with, uh, with equity. Yes. So, you know, if we were to relate this, how, you know, do you have some thoughts on how these, these uh, institutions of learning, whether it be the public library, academic, school library, education, you know, how can they be better? I know you shared one idea about how to work this at a personal level, you know, to understand bias, but institutionally, how do you 
you know, have policies or trainings uh, that, uh, especially for institutions that operate in the public arena, uh, to remove unconscious bias and, you know, have an active stance against bullying or uh, any kind of prejudice that is, uh, that happens as a result of active or passive behavior. Yeah. So I think in terms of in terms of dealing with bias, you can deal with it on your team with these bias interrupters. You got I, I you are making me think about something I haven't really thought about before. So thank you. Uh, if someone if I if I were if I if I were managing a library and someone came in a, 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 so and said something biased, how do we deal with that? And I think the important thing there is to reassure my staff that if they correct the bias and the other person gets upset about it, I have their back. I think it's really important to know that your organization has your back and that and that you don't have to deal with people who come in and say things that are biased. Now, it's much harder when people come in with prejudices. People walk in your door with not just biases, but very conscious prejudices. And so in, in the case of the hiring manager, sh she wasn't going to hire this person because of her hair. And this was a conscious, she was justifying it. She was rationalizing her decision uh, irrationally. <laughs> and, uh, and so it was a very conscious belief. And, and, and that, this brings me to how power can, uh, when, when you add power on top of bias or prejudice, it actually becomes discrimination. It's, so it's now, she's now veered into an illegal territory. So I think that the, the important thing there as a leader is before the incident strikes that you don't know how to deal with, think about how to articulate that line. People can, people can believe whatever they want, want, but they can't impose their beliefs on others necessarily. And where is that line? Where is that line for you as an employer, for you as an organization, and for your relationship with the public? And, and that is very tricky. It's much easier in a private company where, where you can say, you know, I, it's not my responsibility to respect First Amendment rights. And so I'm free to say, no, you cannot, you know, you cannot put, you cannot wear that shirt or put that flag up behind you. Uh, it's much harder. It's much harder for you. But I think beginning to articulate where that line is, is really important. I'll give you an example. So that, that means coming up with a code of conduct, mm -hmm. coming up with a code of conduct. And uh, I'll give you an example. Just uh, before you go to the example, is just coming up with a code of conduct or uh, reinforcing or enforcing that code of, code of conduct that's very important as well. Not just having a piece of paper that says, I must yes. be without prejudice, but people to believe in it that if some if they notice anything that is happening that they must have the courage to stand up and defend their colleague or whoever the you know is the, the on the receiving end of the prejudice knowing that their organization takes this seriously yes yeah that is what is really important is is i will give you just a very simple example of mm -hmm. of uh, what it is like to work at an organization that has a code of conduct versus one that doesn't. So at one point in my career, I was working for a company that did have a very strong code of conduct. And uh, I was chit chatting with a guy before a meeting. And he said, my wife does not work because it is better for the children. Mm. And I assumed he didn't mean that quite in the absolute way that, and so I made a little joke and I said, well, I decided to show up at work today because I thought it would be a good idea to neglect my children. <laughs> and I expected him to have your response to kind of smile and laugh when we'd move, but no, he did not. He dug in and he said, oh no, Kim, it's really not good for your children that you're working and I have all these studies and you should really read them. And so now all of a sudden this is sinking feeling in my heart, which is sometimes why I don't challenge bias because I don't really want to know if it's actually prejudice because now I'm now I'm mad. Now you and, know. 
Yeah, now I know and now I'm mad and now I, I kind of have to deal with it because I realized that if he was responsible for deciding who was going to get what clients and if he thought I shouldn't even be working, he definitely wasn't giving me the out of town clients and I was going to put me at a disadvantage. So I had to deal with it. And luckily in this at this company, I knew that he, you know, that he couldn't do that, that but of course he could, he, you know, the rules are not always enforced. And so I said to him, it is an HR violation for you to tell me I'm neglecting my children just by showing up at work. So that was my it statement. And I could make that statement so categorically because I knew that there was a code of conduct and I knew what it was and I knew it was enforced. And that had the desired effect, he kind of backed off. But then I said, look, I'm not gonna make a big deal of this with HR, but I think you and I need to agree that it is my decision together with my partner, how we raise our children. And it is your decision together with your partner, how you raise your children. And there's, you know, and I have a lot of studies and, and I guess you don't wanna read my studies any more than I wanna read your studies. And so we managed to get past it, but I think that that's an example of why it is, you know, it didn't get escalated because HR had a very clear code of conduct and it was enforced. I never had to escalate to them because the, the, the system was set up and it, 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 it made that line clear for, for folks. But bullying, let's yeah. talk about, well, do you have a question on that first? No, 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 no. Please, please keep going. I'm, I'm enjoying your, your narrative. Please keep going. So bullying, if you, if you establish a clear boundary, the bully's just going to jump over that fence. You know, that's what, the, that's what bullies do. And they're going to keep going until they get stopped. So it's consequences that stop bullying. And so you as leaders need to create, need to teach your, teach your teams how to create conversational consequences for bullying, just how to shut it down. Uh, how to think about making sure that people don't abuse your platform uh, and use it for bullying. And that happens in real life as well as on social media. You need to think about how to create consequences for uh, sort of compensation consequences for bullying. You don't want to promote, you don't want to pay big bonuses if you do performance reviews. You don't you want to make sure that you have there 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 are some real that it hits people where their wallet is and then you want to create career consequences for bullying you don't want to promote bullies you don't want to you you, you don't want to you don't want to force people to work for that manager who is really uh, behaves badly that sort of thing i think that's that that, that that's what i was getting to it's it's a, it's at a personal level as well. The endeavor shouldn't be about to change somebody's beliefs forcefully, but maybe inspire them to listen to a different perspective, do their own research, and make modifications if they feel inspired to do so. There's no harm in agreeing to disagree with respect. But when it turns to a forceful or takes an angle of disrespect, I think that's where People have troubles that people think that boundaries always need to shock people. No. Setting boundaries is great. They can gently, gently warn people about where, you know, what the boundaries are and inspire them to work around them rather than, you know, ram through them and, uh, yeah. and get shocked. So, you know, Kim, one of the things I wanted to ask you that the listeners uh, of this uh, recording will want to know is want to know you um a little personally as well uh and how your readers have responded to you to your earlier work and now just work has there been a story from a reader that has come to you that's inspired you saying hmm i think i'm done i think i earned my bread i you know <laughs> i i you know you inspired somebody and they wrote back to you and you could see how your book has or your work has impacted them uh, greatly. You know, I think one of the, there, there have been a couple of moments since Just Work came out that really made me feel great about having, it's the reason why I write. So there, mm -hmm. there's a, a guy I know who 
uh, was one of the early engineers at, at Lotus. Um, so before there was Excel, there was Lotus sure. 1, 2, 3. Sure. Sure. And, and one of too few black engineers, uh, black software engineers in, in, in tech. And after he read Just Work, he sent me uh, an email and he said, I never imagined that I had so many shared experiences with a Southern white woman. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, you know, because because the goal, my goal of this book is to create solidarity. I think very often when we talk about issues of, of diversity, we, we sort of separate ourselves. And But bias, prejudice, bullying, they impact all of us. They impact every single person on the planet. And if we can unite to understand the different ways these things manifest, we can eliminate these the sort of most disastrous human tendencies, but we can only do it if we do it together. So that was a big moment for me. Oh, how lovely is that? So yeah. Kim, you know, on that note, I want to extend It wouldn't be, more, you know, a Southern. Can you, sorry, can you back up one sentence? We, we lost you for a second. It wouldn't okay. be a day in quarantine without a little. It's, hey, it's technical <laughs> glitch. Is this any better? Kim? Yeah, you're perfect now. So, you know, I was just asking as a Southern white woman living in, uh, you know, out in the suburbs of San Francisco, how's that journey been, you know, what, what activities outside of the mission of uh, just work and your, you know, your personal purpose, what other activities do you enjoy? What has been your personal journey? Uh, you know, give me a view of that as well. Sure. Uh, you know, writing this book, I have to say, it was very, it was, it was exhausting. Yeah. Frankly, it was a very difficult book to write. And I think the things that kept me optimistic uh, throughout, uh, one were, one of the great things about living in California is that nature is all around. So I actually wrote this book in this shed in my backyard. <laughs> and there were, you know, deer would walk by and, uh, and California quail and, uh, and lots of rabbits. And so I think being being able to just walk out of there and take a long walk through nature, I did. I spent a lot of time weeding in my yard. <laughs> uh, that, for some reason, was very therapeutic. Uh, taking long, long hikes. There's a bunch of open space preserves around here. Uh, so, so to me, getting getting outdoors and and moving my moving my body was it really important. Like, I, I, even if I don't have time for a long hike, I take a, a pretty hilly forty five minute walk every day, and and that for me uh, was was really important. I would also say one of the, I'm actually going to write about this shortly. One of some of the most productive times in my whole career have been the times when I quit trying to be productive. Uh, in fact, when I was writing Radical Candor, I felt guilty the whole time because I was taking these long, like sometimes three and four hour hikes uh, every day. But, uh, but, I, but I think that sometimes in order to do creative work, the mind needs to marinate and ideas need, they just need time and space. And giving ideas the time and the space they need is not something that uh, that we're taught is it feel it always feels like an indulgence actually, but but actually it's quite productive I think. I I, I think that's brilliant and I I love the word marinate I uh, whether it be uh, tofu or chicken or ideas they yeah. all need time to soak in the delicious flavors that are on the offing. Yes. And. You know, once that happens, the end product is um, is just that much more succulent, if you will, yeah. because it's had yeah. time to absorb uh, the excrement into itself, and you know, kind of have an amalgamation um, of itself and the external environment, and trying to be one with it. Um, Kim, I think you know, it's when I think about the current societal fabric and the struggles and the media conditioning. Um, I, I think about social media as well. And, you know, um, I was thinking about it last night as, as I was thinking about this chat that you and I are going to have. What is your opinion about social media 
and the deep conditioning that it can have on biases, especially as kids are getting exposed to social media. I dare I use the word addiction uh, yeah. for dopamine hits through yeah. social media. What, what, what is your opinion uh, about social media and how the, the, the younger generation that is getting used to, you know, being behind a screen and that enables some of these, you know, the bullying behavior, cyber bullying being one of them. And, uh, you know, uh, the rate of suicide among teens is just appalling. What is your opinion on that as this young um, group of people transition into our workforce where they're forced to uh, work in person when we can work in person again and collaborate in person when they're used to hiding behind a digital screen and having, you know, different personas. Yeah, it is really, you know, it is really tempting, even as a person who's sitting here in Silicon Valley, to just say, just shut it all down, just like turn it off. Mm -hmm. uh, because there is so much risk associated with it. But the fact of the matter is, it has also done wonderful things. I think Me Too and Black Lives Matter would not have had the, the strength that those movements have had without social media. Uh, Susan Fowler's in tech, the, the sort of Me Too story was Susan Fowler's Uber story. Mm -hmm. And there were other stories, by the way, that were written first, one by a black, uh, a black woman, another by a Latina woman that didn't take off. So let's, I, I just want to acknowledge that. Yeah. Uh, that's a, pr a problem. Social media, it reflects and reinforces and speeds up mm -hmm. uh, all of the things that are inherent in our <laughs> And in, in, in real life. So for another simple example, I noticed one day on LinkedIn that everybody they were suggesting I connect with was white. Uh, mm. And and this was partly my fault. It was a reflection of my network, but it was also getting reinforced and reflected and exacerbated by LinkedIn's <laughs> algorithm. Uh, and so I don't want to blame it all on LinkedIn. It was partly my fault. But I, but I sort of realized, you know, if, if I'm conscious of this, I can change it. And so I kept clicking and eventually I got a more diverse uh, set of, and now I think I'm by consciously balancing, by measuring, this is another thing I talk about in Just Work, you've gotta be willing to measure what matters. You've gotta be willing to quantify your bias. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I was willing to break down my network by, by gender and by race, and this does not take, by the way, tremendous analytical skills. Like sometimes, sometimes, uh, you know, I, I, as I was looking back over my career, I wrote in the book, gosh, you know, this team that I managed was, they were all white men, all of them. Like, how did I do that? How, you know, it's sort of, it was sort of appalling to admit, but if I don't admit that, and, and this like does not take big math skills to say. <laughs> There's zero women on the team, right? Uh, but but it does take some emotional discipline to admit that. And there's an interesting thing about, so I wrote that in the book and I had a bunch of people read the book early. And a woman who I worked with uh, at that company read that and she said, gosh, that's really horrible. Well, I guess I can forgive you. But she hadn't noticed at the time either. <laughs> like, yeah. like neither one of us, it's so much part of the, the, just the, when we're in these situations, we, we, we can't fix problems we refuse to notice. And so if you start measuring things and quantifying things, then you're forced to notice them. And then you're forced to try to understand why this happened and to fix it. I think, Kim, you know, I, as I was thinking about this, uh, I'll take a tangent and remind all our listeners, this is the time for you to all submit your questions for Kim. I'm going to keep my eyes open for it. Um, uh, we do have a hard stop in about 15 minutes, but please submit your questions using the Q&A feature, post them in the chat. I have my eyes on both of them. Okay, back to you, Kim. So, uh, Kim, you know, as I was listening to you, you know, the internship and the apprenticeship programs, which I um, am very, very fond of, wherever I've worked, I've personally ran um, the internship programs and, you know, I like the apprenticeship um, methodology a little more because, you know, it reflects somebody taking somebody under their wing and showing them the ropes, not just 
saying, yeah. hey, you're an intern, go fetch me coffee. Yeah. Um, and uh, not that, you know, they won't get their steps in while getting coffee. Yeah. You know, it's <laughs> that's not the purpose. But my view is, you know, your book and the thoughts about just work, I think, you know, the sooner that we can get this in front of these younger professionals who are coming out of, uh, you know, this social media bubble or, you know, there's only it's physics, right? There's only so much time, so much media that you can consume. You can't see both sides. You're not trained to see both sides. And you tend to gravitate towards familiar thought process, whether it be familiarity from home or work or school. Uh, I, I think that, you know, your book would, in my view, would also serve a big purpose in, in the upper grades in high school, uh, maybe in college for work training, apprenticeship programs as well. Um, you know, I can see this as an essential reading tool in the junior year or senior year, both in high school and college. When you're getting this through, it's not just an MBA book to learn about prejudice and bias. And I mean, this is a practical tool set that all young professionals can, can use to reflect, unlearn, and then relearn certain things so that they're most productive in a professional environment and that they don't commit faux pas that can actually be a detriment to their career growth. What do you think of that while we wait for questions, Kim? Yeah, I think that's, I, I, I would love that if, if <laughs> everybody must read Just Work. Uh, no, I core think- Core curriculum, I, core curriculum. Yeah, part of the core, core curriculum. One of the thing, one of the reasons why I wrote this book was because I, I really suffered a lot early in my career from from a bunch of bad experiences, and I had no idea at the time how to handle them. Whether this was just life and I had to deal with it, whether I could challenge it, and and I I had. You know, I really was depressed at, for a certain point in my career. It was it was sort of awful, and so I really wanted to. A, a big part for me of writing is reaching out to my younger self and saying, "Here's what happens. Here's how to here's how to categorize it, and here's what to do about it." And uh, and so I I hope. And in fact, as I was writing the book, I had a lot of young people <clears throat> in high school and college reading it and giving me feedback and i would say i learned probably more from them than they did from me uh so so i would love to have more dialogue with with young people uh, in, uh about these ideas in in these books and and help i think one of the problems with social media to go back to that question is that it does further polarize us uh, I think what has happened sort of physically, at least in this country, happens in, in even greater, in, in an even more intense way on social media. So for example, I mentioned I grew up in Memphis. I was like, my father's friends called me Alan's little pinko. So I, the, my, my liberal views were not welcome, especially. And like so many people, I moved to, a you know, in that situation, I moved to a more liberal part of the country. And there's part of me that, you know, that feels sad that I left my home, that, that, that I, we couldn't <clears throat> find a better way to talk and communicate and, uh, and, and have these reasonable conversations. And so that's part also part of what I wanted to achieve with Just Work is to help people who, who view the world differently, learn how to work together. And, and to move past those differences. Uh, and in some, in some cases, challenge, I, I mean, I always think it's a good idea to challenge prejudices. But, but I, there's also times when I just wanna make sure that everybody stays on the right side of the, that line. I think that's good. Uh, Kim, uh, you know, one of the questions that my leaders is asking me here, uh, who's, on, who's on this uh, webinar is, you know, maybe some tips and tricks of the trade before I force them to read this book, but some tips and tricks of the trade that they can practice on a daily basis. And I know we spoke about, you know, biases during hiring and creating a slate of people that's, you know, at least diverse, and then you pick the right person for the job, but some tips and tricks that they can actually do every day uh, to check themselves. If somebody yeah. is actively wanting to unlearn and relearn 
what's something they can do every day just like you know they work out every day what can they do spend 5 minutes every day on on this i think that one one thing you can do is is the bias like be conscious of when you notice bias and 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 practicing raising it inviting someone in to because if you it's it is uncomfortable to do but once you start building the stamina to do it it's actually not that it's not that hard to wave the purple flag uh or, or to point out you know i don't think you really meant that the way it sounded and and nine times out of t- 10 people are actually really grateful to you for right. doing that another thing that you can do is you can find people in your life who are your bias busters so mm-hmm. in the course of of writing just work i i actually worked with several bias busters because I knew that I was making different mistakes in, in, in different ways. And so I asked people to point these. So it's like, it's a, to go back to radical canter, it's about soliciting feedback specifically around one's own biases. Mm-hmm. And it's gonna be hard at first. I remember I was working with, with one woman, Breeze Harper, and she pointed out, I think there were about eight or nine words that I tended to use that were either ableist or reflected racist tropes. And and my first instinct was, oh my gosh, there's no word in the English language that's safe for me to use. And which of course was ridiculous. It was eight words out of, I don't know, how many words are there? Like 200,000 words in the English sure, language. Sure. Um, so again, quantifying your bias helps. Like eight out of 200,000 is not too many. And, and it also, helped me realize how even even once I had gotten past that I was open to the feedback now like one of the words was see I often say I see when I mean I notice or I understand right and so it's a sloppy sight metaphor in ableist and I really cared about that one a lot I mean I cared about all of the ones she pointed out but th- there was another person who was reading the book who's a historian very clear thinker who's blind and so partly i cared about it because i care about zach who was helping me edit the book and also i cared about it because i words matter to me i'm a writer and so i didn't want to use sloppy sight metaphors but before i turned the book in to my editor i realized i did a search and i realized i had used guess how many it's 350 page book guess how many times i had used sloppy sight metaphors Mm. 99, 99. And this was after I was aware of it. And so one of the things that I encourage people to do is to be, you have to be sort of patient with yourself, but also persistent. And so get, get people to point out daily because all of us, all of us are saying and doing biased things on a day and we're pattern makers and if we interrupt the pattern we can change the pattern and make a better one but we have to be open to hearing about it we have to take really a growth mindset towards that and be open to and you know the be open to uh, criticism that that propels you into evolving and for you to learning something new and not uh, you be stuck i i think him that's it's been great i think we've uh, run out of questions. We are almost out of time, and um, you know you've answered some of the questions that uh, were coming in from our panel and our attendees as well. Very, very grateful. So uh, grateful that you uh, wrote your previous book and and the current one. Uh, I am a, I'm your personal champion uh, at promoting this. Thank you so much for your empathy, for your kindness, uh, and uh, for your time. Uh, this morning and thank you so much thank you you've just made eight long lonely years writing two books worthwhile so i'm deeply grateful thank you kim thank you so much for everything and i wish you all the best uh all the best with this new book thank you thank you so much bye-bye bye-bye